Well, welcome to the ISS, particularly to um, what I think is quite a few new faces who I've not seen here before. I'm Ben Barry, the Senior Fellow for Land Warfare, uh, and it's no secret that I'm two years um, out of a full career in the British Army, which was fantastic fun. I joined it in 1975. Now, why is that relevant? Is that actually between 1975 and now, there have been quite a few reorganisations. I clocked reorganisations in 75, 78, 82, 91, 93, 98, and 2004. And of those reorganisations, a slim majority reduced the size of the army um, as a result of budget cuts. But three of those reorganisations saw modest increases in the size of the army. And two of those were actually driven by unanticipated operational demand in Northern Ireland and Bosnia. And from 2006 onwards, there's also been a stream of major and minor changes to the army, which were driven by the imperatives of the wars that were going on. So after the 2010 United Kingdom Strategic Defence and Security Review, no one should have been surprised that the army was to reorganise. Now, when this was announced in the summer, much of the commentary in London and the defence media focused on reductions in strength, disbandment of famous regiments, and also the reliance of the army on reserves. But when I analysed Army 2020, I saw a real effort to institutionalise the relevant lessons of recent wars, to anticipate the nature of future conflict, and I also saw some radical ideas. And I came to the view that this made the reorganisation, in total, the most radical since the end of British conscription 50 years ago. And it is, or my judgment is, that it's more radical than the current reorganisations, not only of the Royal Navy and Royal Air Force, but also the changes being made to many armies, including, for example, the armies of the United States of America and Germany. So that's why I invited General Abraham to come and explain not only the changes that are to be made, but also the thinking and the new ideas behind those changes. Now, he's uniquely qualified to speak to us, as he spent much of the last two years as the Army's Director of Force Development at the heart of this redesign exercise. And now as Director General Army Reform, he's overseeing the implementation not only of the Army 2020 changes, but also a raft of other change programmes resulting from the reorganisation of Defence and the Ministry of Defence, which has also arisen as a result of the UK Strategic Defence and Security Review. The General's going to speak for about half an hour, and his, speak, his, his speech and the PowerPoints he's going to use are on the record. But we will then take about 30 minutes of Q&A, and that discussion will be off the record. General, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about the rationale uh, for Army 2020. Because as Ben said in his introduction, uh, there has been uh, quite a bit of focus on various facets of Army 2020. But I think it's important uh, for people more broadly to understand the why and not just the what of, of, of what results in terms of the force structure and so on. The, um, the prime catalyst for doing the Army 2020 redesign project um, you know, became clear in July of last year when there was an announcement that the regular army, and this was uh, some six, seven, eight months after the SDSR uh, announcement, when there was this announcement the regular army would reduce from, um, by about 20% to uh, around 82,000 personnel no later than 2020. Uh, and that, of course, was driven by the fiscal context, uh, the, the national fiscal context, and indeed uh, the government spending profile accordingly. That, that was the prime catalyst to start to do it because we, we couldn't, as it were, treat th the army we had before uh, and then just slice 20% off it. Um, we, we needed to do something significantly different uh, accordingly. So, prime catalyst, but not the only or even necessarily the principal driver within it. It also offered an opportunity in the wake of the publication of the Strategic Defence and Security Review, uh, published just over two years ago, um, of, of continuing the logic, of continuing much of what was set out in the prose of the SDSR. And in particular, that related uh, for us um, to the setting of what the SDSR calls the adoption of an adaptable posture as our strategic policy framework. 
That includes, but is not limited to, the maintenance of conventional forces as a form of deterrent, including the demonstrable ability to regenerate a force in different strategic circumstances in the future. So that was, that was something that played quite largely in our design of the Army 2020, in that the ability to maintain a structure that was demonstrably regeneratable in different strategic circumstances was an important introduction accordingly. The other thing, of course, um, that, um, that, that grew growing certainty and so on was, of course, the political signalling uh, announcements and decisions uh, about the timing uh, of the end of our combat operations in Afghanistan by the end of 2014. The British Army has, rightly and necessarily, increasingly in the last few years, become the British Army uh, designed for use in Afghanistan. And beyond, the, uh, be beyond 2014, we needed further to diversify the roles, structures and capabilities of the armies against a broader prospective problem set and, and to reduce the degree of structural and capability specialization uh, for Afghanistan accordingly. Another big, big driver, and this was announced on uh, the same day in July by the last Secretary of State, uh, what, what, what was the, the Independent Commission on Reserves. This was, as it were, a codicil to the Strategic Defence and Security Review. Uh, they, they couldn't do that uh, form of review in the time available, so it was set up, led by General Nick Horton, Vice Chief, but led as an independent commissioner to produce a report. And I'm only going to talk about the Army context there, but uh, th there, were, there were numerous important recommendations within there. I'll, j I'll, just, I'll just talk about the three I've, uh, I've highlighted on the slide there. Firstly, is that the Army's reserve, despite the fact that it had been used um, uh, to, to, to telling effect in Iraq, Afghanistan, and indeed the Balkans before that, is that the way we were using it was contributing to a longer-term decline in the territorial army, and that we, re we needed initially to stabilize and then grow the territorial army to an anticipated level of 30,000 trained volunteer reservists uh, by 2018. The second thing was um, the, the territorial army largely, not exclusively, but largely still was structured to act as a, as a supplement for use in limited circumstance. It was designed that way. It wasn't used that way, but it was designed to be used as a supplement to the regular army in certain circumstances. But that meant that there were either ill-defined roles for it in a collective sense, um, or, or there were roles which were not properly aligned to what the rest of the army needed to be capable of doing. We needed to balance the reserve and the regular bits accordingly. Third thing, this is quite important, particularly in the context of a British army which for the first time, well, by 2020, will be for the first time in goodness knows how many hundred years, will be pre predominantly based in the United Kingdom, uh, was the Horton Commission's uh, uh, direction that w the army, the armed forces in fact, needed better to connect with the society from which they sustain themselves, they recruit, and they needed to do that increasingly through the medium of the reserve. That took us to the second, I've already talked about the adaptable uh, design principle, that took us to the second principle design principle of the Army 2020, in that we re redesigned, and this hasn't happened very often in the past, we redesigned the regular and the reserve components of the Army at the same time in order that they provided a fit like that against the range of tasks set to us in the SDSR. The big change, we would operate the reserve by integration with the regular army, or you can put it the other way around if you like. We would, we would cease to treat it largely as a supplement. The other big thing that uh, was an important thing to factor into our work was the announcement that the army uh, would, in basic terms, would withdraw from Germany by the end of 2020. And as I said, for the first time in a very long time, the majority of the army had to come. And we needed to provide, and we, I think we did, I'll come back to it later, we needed to provide a rationale for how we would prefer to base the army when it is in the United Kingdom, um, over and beyond just simply the layout of barracks, uh, as it were. And the last thing, as Ben mentioned in his introduction, we also needed to continue to incorporate uh, various things we've learned from past lessons, operational lessons, that we think are of enduring value, and indeed staring at the future, uh, future character of conflict, uh, 
and, and incorporate lessons from that, not least from the Army's <coughs> Agile Warrior Force Development Program, um, so that we were incorporating things from that in a relevant manner in Army 2020. So we were adapting, we were setting out against a radically different set of criteria than the Army of today was designed against accordingly. One thing that we did do is to try and codify, uh, because it's nowhere specifically done for us, but is to codify what the core purposes of the future army are to be. I mean, there are, there are several pieces of important strategic direction uh, laid out by the government in the last few years, including the SDSR, the National Security Strategy, and other important pieces of work, such as the BSOS, the Building Stability Overseas Strategy, uh, and the like. Taking all those and, and, and codifying it to a simple and usable form, these are the three core purposes that we see for the British Army of 2020. That, that described in the top left-hand ball is, is largely the very successful legacy of the SDR of 90, 1998, uh, making the Army usable at strategic distance and at appropriate states of readiness, the maintenance of power projection uh, for expeditionary operations. And we need, we're told, to continue to be able to do that, of course. We needed to continue that. But I think the other two balls are our significant new design determinants, uh, at, at least now, although some of them have been in the past in various measures. The top right-hand one, overseas engagement, defense engagement as part of a broader government approach uh, to building a capacity abroad, tackling at root the causes of instabilities to try and head off the need uh, for, for, for interventions uh, in the wake of instability accordingly. Um, that is, of course, is not a new task. We, we have always done that in the Army. The extent to which we have been able to do it uh, in the era of the Balkans, Iraq and Afghanistan has been constrained. Uh, by the, the primary need to support those operations as main efforts. Uh, but we have continued to do stuff. But there is an opportunity in the wake of the SDSR, the National Security Strategy and so on, for the British Army to play a significantly different, uh, 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 play a, a much, to a much greater extent and by design, not only in terms of how we structure the force in the future, but also potentially, I hope, in how we educate and train people to operate in that space. The bottom one, UK engagement and homeland resilience, um, sometimes called homeland resilience, sometimes called UK, UK operations, the, the, the provision of organised mass uh, in support of other government departments to provide resilience. Good example, Olympics and Paralympics accordingly. The UK engagement one is, is, is slightly different, though, from that. It's importantly different. Um, in, it, well, it's in the Army's vested interest better to engage with the society from which it recruits um, for at least two reasons. Firstly, uh, the, the, diverse, the ethnic diversification of that society. By 2020, we think about 25% of the Army's traditional recruiting range, range will be from ethnic minorities. We need better to engage in order to sustain ourselves uh, in, in, in the face of that demographic challenge. The second thing is we need consistently to be able to demonstrate, and across a wide threshold of tasks, to demonstrate utility, relevance, and value to the armed forces. And I think it's quite interesting, I'm sure most of you would agree with me, that in terms of you know, the, the, the army and the other services uh, turning out um, to backfill the security problem at the Olympics was a really good demonstration of relevance, utility, and value accordingly. Um, it wasn't all planned uh, to start with, uh, but actually, as, as it turned out, I think it was a major success. Now, of course, there are variations within that. There is specialist stuff. The Army provides a degree of counter-IED, uh, EOD disposal, and so on. Uh, but in this, we are looking at how we can design, base, and then organize the Army routinely to be able to play a part in those sort of things accordingly. Um, I won't labor on these, um, but uh, I'll highlight a few. The, these are some of very many of the things we have drawn out of our operational lessons compendium and indeed our staring at the future, the future character of conflict thing, which played a part in here, uh, which played a part in the design of Army 2020. I, I think the first one is important, is that we need, by design, to maintain the separation of close tactical command and control on operations and a level above it what in army speak we call the brigade level of command and the divisional level of command. And we must be careful in the future not to overload 
brigade levels of command with the complexities of multinational, interagency, etc., etc., with brigade headquarters, which are normally designed to do close tactical planning and execution. And therefore, we need to maintain by design a divisional level of command and resource it accordingly in order to provide a proper separation of the tactical from the higher tactical, lower operational space accordingly. Um, I'll also major a little bit on the third one. We have learnt shed loads in the course of Iraq and Afghanistan about the integration of, bit of jargon here, soft effect um, into military manoeuvre. You know. And this, this plays you know, in the joint space, the interagency, the host nation, the capacity building of uh, indigent uh, security forces and so on and so on, the integration uh, of other stabilization uh, protagonists and so on and so on. We have learned a lot about this, so, have, so has everybody who has taken part in Afghanistan. We need to institutionalize that, and I'll talk a little bit later about a new venture in Army 2020 called the Security Assistance Group, which aims to enshrine uh, what we need to preserve from that accordingly. Um, I talked about, in, in the context of the top right-hand ball, uh, about doing defense engagement. That, that's, that's, that's where it's laid out in the Strategic Defense and Security Review. Uh, a fairly explicit statement of the future level of ambition to direct more non-operational defense engagement overseas. It is fair to say that there is a degree of cross-Whitehall work going on uh, to turn strategy, policy, as it were, into plans. And as, as the capacity of the army to do this grows, and of course that is constrained uh, uh, to, to an extent while we're in Afghanistan, is, is that the key to this is going to be to have those regional engagement strategies, national engagement plans properly laid out so that an army which is increasingly designed to be able to do this can indeed do it accordingly. Those were, and those relate to defence, uh, and the Army of course plays a part in that, those were, those were the defence planning assumptions as they are called, as, as laid out in the SDSR, uh, which determine you know, our, our base assumptions for um, concurrency, scale, uh, and, and the like for military operations abroad. So these are very definitely in the ex expeditionary sense. Those were laid out in the SDSR. Those did not change in the wake of the, um, the further reductions made to the size of the regular army. It wasn't going to be 94 and a half. It was going to be 82,000. Those did not change. So the big challenge was, and, and, and the response is, through the integration of the reserve, is how do you maintain your ability to do those tasks, at those concurrencies, at strategic distance, with a 20% smaller army and with a revitalized reserve accordingly. You talk a little bit about the reserves. The, these, I mean, it, it, it was a complex thing, but to stress, we, we, we redesigned the regular and reserve components at the same time in, in order that they would best fit each other. We saw three broad order areas where the reserves would contribute. Specialists, where we cannot or it is not cost effective to maintain those specialism in the regular armed forces. And in many cases, uh, you know, they just don't exist. Trauma surgeons, etc., uh, operating uh, in, in, in the Bastion Field Hospital today. We, we couldn't sustain career structures for surgeons of that quality. They will come from the reserve. A bit broader than the, the medical, though. Cyber, of course, growth, linguists, and so on. The second one was, and the key to this was, obviously part-time volunteer reserve, um, is you have to constrain the prospective task and in defining, better defining tasks, you need to match it to the time available for training and, and maintenance of those skills. So we put the biggest onus on delivery from the reserve into those areas where, a bit more military jargon, the collective training bill is lower. So that tended to be in the transport, supply, distribution and repair areas rather than in the combat areas where the integration of training takes a lot more time accordingly. So, so you will see there, there is a, a profound structural reliance in the combat support and combat service support parts of the army upon the reserve. It is a structural reliance. It is no longer an optional add-on to be able to do uh, the sort of operations we're told to be capable of. But 
preservation of the combat arms. I mean, it's quite interesting. The U.S. Army Reserve, not the National Guard, but the U.S. Army Reserve, has almost no combat arms in it whatsoever. They have lots of combat arms in the National Guard. Um, they, they are mainly about combat support and combat service support. But in our territorial army, we are retaining combat arms because they, are, they have an important role to play um, either in certain, uh, in the delivery of operational, in certain operational circumstances appropriate to their training uh, state, but also as a basis for regeneration, uh, this adaptable strategic policy framework, as the basis uh, around which you can regenerate forces in different strategic circumstances in the future. And to hammer the nail out of sight, you know, this is now a complement, not a supplement to the army. It is no longer a strategic reserve as it was in the Cold War, designed for use in extremis. And the majority of operations in which the army takes part, the army of 2020 takes part in the future, will feature reservists, not by accident, but by design. That changes the threshold for how you make the reserve work. And indeed, um, uh, I'll come back to that in the context of the green paper currently on circulation. Just a quick reminder, I'm not going to labor. Uh, this was well covered in July, August, uh, in the media and elsewhere, as to what the Army 2020 constituent parts come. Uh, reaction forces uh, optimized for high readiness and indeed uh, uh, you know, problems which require um, uh, intervention with a serious uh, demands on m maneuver, mobility, force protection, the ability to do war fighting at relatively high readiness. A divisional headquarters, three armoured infantry brigades, and an air assault brigade, 16 air assault brigade. And then, and this is where it gets new, an adaptable force, a force which maintains a degree of residual structure, military structures, battalions, brigades, and so on, but which is there to be adapted in the face of different tactical, operational, or strategic circumstances accordingly. And that comes out as a divisional headquarters and seven infantry brigades. Force troops is the third part of it. This is combat support, combat service support, artillery, engineers, transport supply distribution, uh, maintained centrally, but which, which, which face either the adaptable force or the reaction forces, depending on their prescribed role. And there are about 10 combat support brigades, combat support and service support brigades in there. Um, I'm not going to talk through all of those because it would take forever. But I'll just highlight the, uh, the thing on the bottom left, the security assistance group. This is, this is new, or this is an updating of something uh, that we already have in the form of, uh, and the commander's here, Alan Richmond, there he is, the commander of the Military Stabilization Support Group. At the moment, we have developed um, a lot of military capability and organized ourselves accordingly to do uh, capacity building uh, and stabilization support in what you might call downstream of intervention, Iraq and Afghanistan. The trick, particularly in this era of the government's intent to do more overseas engagement, more defense engagement, is to turn this into an organization that is capable of doing it upstream of an intervention in order to head off the requirement, to stabilize and reduce the requirement for intervention accordingly. Um, we're doing, we are, this is work in progress as to what this will be, precisely what it will do and so on. We, the Army, are doing this work in, in consultation with a stabilization unit and therefore by implication the Foreign Office and DFID and other interested parties accordingly. But this is the broader order uh, range of functions that we expect it to operate. This will enshrine, or, or the plan is, this will enshrine and institutionalize what we have learned in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and the like, in order that we can do it better and be prepared to do it, including upstream of intervention in the future. The adaptable, the reaction force are relatively familiar territory. The adaptable force is um, a radical departure. What we've effectively done here is to softwire a force so that it is easily capable of adaptation against a very broad range of tasks. Those are a lot of them. Um, the adaptable force needs to be capable of adapting to provide 4th, 5th, maybe 6th brigade rulements in any future enduring operation at about brigade level. It needs to pre pre be prepared and prepare itself uh, to take a part in national resilience, UK operations, defence engagement particularly, and we seek, uh, we haven't quite finished this, but we seek to align units and adaptable force brigades against regions of the world so that over time they build up cultural, linguistic 
and situational awareness of these regions so that their contributions are properly cited when they are called for accordingly. Uh, the part I talked earlier about engaging with UK society to demonstrate utility, relevance and value and recruit. And also as a basis for regeneration in the future if strategic circumstances change accordingly. The, um, I said earlier that the, we, we will have a profound reliance on the reserve, the volunteer reserve in the future. And as I say, it's now done by design. If you look at the top part of that slide, uh, some of you have seen this before, I think, but it, it's an illustration of, of what proportion by volume the volunteer re reserve would play on a, an imaginary future enduring operation at a smallish brigade level, say 6,500. Now, clearly, the composition of any operation depends on the nature of the task, etc., etc., but this is illustrative. So at the, at the left-hand end of that, at the relatively high readiness, we, we have constrained, and it is largely specialists um, or combat service support, uh, to about 15% of the force. By the time you get to, you know, this is probably two, two and a half years in, you're up to nearly 40% of the force. So therefore, we expect around 40% of a brigade two, two, two and a half years into any future operation to come from the reserve. But it's not only about volume, it is also about the, 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 the nature of the reliance as well. On the left-hand side, early on in time, you've got a heavy reliance on individual augmentees. That is how we have tended to use the reserve in Iraq and Afghanistan. But as I said earlier, we also require collective outputs, regiments, companies and squadrons from the reserve to play their part here. So these collective organisations grow. Individual augmentees there, small reliance on individual augmentees here, but a big reliance. And down here, you have whole TA transport regiments operating as such. No regular in there, accordingly. That is, uh, that is the most profound structural reliance we will have had on the reserve probably uh, since the end of the Second World War. This is a, a funny slide. <clears throat> it's what the UK would look like uh, if you drew, drew it according to demographic concentration, con population concentration accordingly. Why does that matter to us? Well, when it comes to working out how we base and operate the army in the, from and in the UK in the future, uh, we need to start with the principle that reservists come, by and large, from urban concentrations. That is where the best recruited units tend to be. Those that operate most successfully tend to come from there. And in the adaptable force, where the majority of the reserve contribution will play its part, not all of it, but the majority, we need to create um, important pairings and alignments between regular and reserve units to help vitalize and provide and enable training of the reserve. Reserve training is going to have to be very efficient. It's based on, a, on an expectation of a mean of 40 man training days a year, a little bit more uh, than, than, is, than is currently the practice, but we're going to have to do that pretty efficiently. And the regular army, through a series of pairing mechanisms, can help that make. But of course, the pairing will work better the more geographically aligned it is. So, one of the start points in that and coming up with our basing settlement for the Army of 2020 needs to play a significant, uh, needs to place significant emphasis on where the reserve is, which is pretty much where it is likely to be in 2020 as well. So, I've talked about the two big design determinants of Army 2020, that it be an adaptable army and that it be an integrated army. The adaptable thing, the adaptable principle, can take place at various levels. At the tactical level, you know, you might say you know, your ability to do um, a degree of things in a particular culture, nature or region, you will need to be adaptable in the sense of how you learn languages, learn the culture and so on. Um, we, we, we will do that. We're pretty good at that. The other two levels are, are harder. You, you, we need to be prepared to adapt the force into the mission-specific circumstances of any future operation. So if we end up doing a form of stabilization operation in country X, uh, some in the world, a as it goes on, we will need to, as we did for the British Army for Afghanistan, we will need consciously to have to adapt the army 
to make it uh, you know, optimized for, for that particular campaign. That's, well, we've had quite a bit of experience of doing that for Afghanistan, uh, and uh, we need to make sure that we maintain the knowledge and ability as to how to do that. And uh, the highest level of call, uh, highest level of all, of course, is the ability to regenerate mass and scale as part of the deterrence requirement, the adaptable policy framework. That is quite broad order and requires more than the contribution of the army to deliver. You know, it has political, social, industrial, economic consequences accordingly. And understanding how we would do that is something, uh, well, the army can play a part in, but it needs to be done, by, it, well, needs to be done. It is intended to be done by broader government accordingly. And secondly, uh, the integrated army. This takes us on, or this takes me on, um, last week, the Secretary of State published a green paper, a consultation on the future reserves. Um, it's obviously um, uh, available in open forum, and we very much hope that as many people as have a voice in this will contribute to that. But these, from the Army's perspective, are the four critical elements in delivering the integrated army so that it is a properly manned to 30,000 trained soldiers by 2018 and that it, its availability is assured because, as I said before, we now rely, we don't just supplement our operational orbits with the reserve. Um, the scale of change is considerable uh, and of course any change program of such magnitude comes with a degree of uncertainty, a degree of risk accordingly. Um, we are going with our reliance on the reserve into uh, a degree of new territory for us. Um, the resource bill um, is, is not fully known. We do have a big injection of cash uh, from the center. In the Army's case, 1.2 billion pounds over 10 years. Uh, the second thing, in making that reserve work, we're going to require a degree of political and, dare I say it, a degree of social um, decision-making that allows the routine mobilization of the reserve in nearly all operations in which the army will go to. We need to change the culture within the army from a regular and a reserve army to an that of an integrated army. And, uh, well, I think I've covered the reliance accordingly. We need yet to operationalize um, our defense engagement policy and strategy. Uh, this is, of course, important uh, for the reasons it was laid out in the SDSR and elsewhere, uh, strategic effect, UK's national interests. It's also important to the Army because defense engagement beyond Afghanistan will be one of the means by which we provide vitality, variety, adventure, and stimulation to the young men and women who will serve in the Army. And we have to get into our, our, the Army's DNA this expectation of that you are almost always going to be in some form of adaptation according to changing circumstances in the future. So the Army 2020 comes up with a structure, but it is our expectation that within that structure we will have often and regularly to adapt it to fit the circumstance of the day. And finally, um, at the moment, as I explained, we have a balance between combat, combat support and service support in the reserve, we've maintained that against a broad set of criteria. Of course, in different strategic circumstances, we might require a different balance uh, and would, would need to change it, as we would the regular army as well. But at the moment, that balance is set against the criteria I've set.